Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. I welcome you today. We are joined today by Council Members Peter Ku, Carlina Rivera, and Kalman Yeager. Today we will hold public hearings on two individual landmark designations by the Landmarks Preservation Commission and one application for the acquisition of office space by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. In addition to these items, we will also vote on the historic landmark designation of 827-829 and 831 Broadway, which was laid over from our February 6th meeting. Before we begin our hearings, I want to recognize Council Member Rivera to offer remarks about the designation of the Broadway buildings. Council Member Rivera. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all my colleagues here today. So dear fellow council members, I would like to reiterate the support of this office to designate 827-831 Broadway as individual landmarks and to protect this historic resource in District 2. The Landmarks Preservation Commission granted the deserved landmark designation to these buildings in 2017. These two structures are elegant 19th century buildings built of cast iron in the Neo-Greco style and date back to the Civil War era. They serve as reminders of the industriousness of New York City's former manufacturing district and the detailed architecture of the period. As many of Manhattan's downtown lofts shifted from purely commercial use to centers of cultural output, A27-831 Broadway became home to the art studios of 20th century greats such as William and Elaine de Kooning and Paul Jenkins. Currently, we are experiencing increased development in this neighborhood. The area from 8th to 14th streets from 4th to 5th avenues has become the latest target of site assembling speculators. Beautiful historic townhouses and ornate industrial revolution era buildings have met the wrecking ball. We are losing piece by piece the architectural significance of central Greenwich Village and is replaced by uniform glass towers. Since these buildings not only serve as examples of architectural history, but also stand as reminders of our city's industrial age and artistic heritage, I ask that you preserve their role by supporting their designation as New York City landmarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Our first public hearing today will be on LU 26. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize Council Member Espinal who's joined us today. Welcome. The first public hearing today will be on LU 26 concerning the designation of the Interborough Rapid Transit Company Powerhouse at 855-869 11th Avenue in Manhattan as an historic landmark. The site is located in the 6th Council District represented by Council Member Helen Rosenthal. The second item is LU 27 concerning the designation of the Empire State Dairy Company buildings at 2840 Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn as a historic landmark. The site is located in the 37th Council District represented by Council Member Rafael Espinal. We now welcome com comments from Council Member Espinal. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Adams and the members of the subcommittee on landmarks. Uh, I am not a member of this committee, but I thought it was important for me to be here to talk about uh, a landmark that's happening in my district in Cypress Hills, East New York. Uh, as you know, these are one of the first neighborhoods to undergo a major rezoning under the mayor's affordable housing New York plan. In my discussions with the community and the administration, I was always clear that the final East New York community plan must take concrete steps to preserve the existing character of our neighborhoods. The Empire State Dairy is known across the community for its distinct appearance and is an ongoing reminder of East New York's industrial past. My goal throughout the rezoning process was to make sure that industrial businesses thrive in East New York once again. And I am proud that the final East New York Community Plan includes an investment of more than $16 million to support and improve the East New York industrial business zone. We must continue to strike a balance between building livable neighborhoods, neighborhoods that include quality affordable housing and community resources, and creating space for manufacturers, businesses to thrive, and also to preserve uh, important buildings like this one. 
The Empire State Dairy is already is already a landmark in every East New Yorker's heart. As our neighborhood grows and new buildings begin to appear along Atlantic Avenue, the smokestacks of the Empire State Dairy will serve as a reminder of our neighborhood's <coughs> history and resilience. And again, uh, you know, I'm hoping everyone can vote in support. I also want to thank uh, some of the community leaders who, who were part of this process. I know we have them here in the room. We have Roy and we have um, uh, Penny. <laughs> Thanks for being here and uh, looking forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Espinal. Thank you. Representatives of the Landmarks Preservation Commission will present both items. We will then hear testimony from the public on each item individually. If you would like to testify on either of these items, please see the Sergeant at Arms and fill out an appearance slip indicating the item on which you intend to speak. We'd like to call up the first panel. LPC representatives Ali Rasulnajad and Lisa Kersavich. Hi, Lisa. I'd like to recognize at this time Council Member Salamanca and Council Member Barron. Welcome. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council member questions? Thank you. Before you begin your testimony, please identify yourselves for the record. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Adams and subcommittee members. Uh, my name is Lisa Krasavage. I'm the Director of Strategic Planning um, and Special Projects at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And I'm Ali Rasulmanajad, uh, Director of Community and Intergovernmental Affairs at LPC. Thanks very much. You may begin. Thank you. Um, we are here to present two recent designations by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Let me go back one more. Um, on December 5th, 2017, the Commission voted to designate the Empire State Dairy Company buildings in East New York, Brooklyn, and the Innerborough Rapid Transit Company powerhouse in Manhattan. The Empire State Dairy Company buildings are a prominent ensemble of late 19th and early 20th century industrial buildings on Atlantic Avenue in East New York. Comprising six buildings, these together represent the manufacturing history of the neighborhood and showcase a significant development in the milk industry, which was making great strides in quality and safety at the time these buildings were constructed. LPC identified this as a potential landmark in 2016 as part of our work to identify historic preservation opportunities in East New York with its rezoning. The complex is prominently located on the south side of Atlantic Avenue between Schneck Avenue and Barbary Street in an area characterized by a mix of industrial and commercial buildings and low-scale residential buildings dating mainly from the early to mid 20th century when expanding transit lines and roadways to the areas advanced the growth of population and the industry in the area. The area fronting Atlantic Avenue and outlined in red on the map is the landmark site. The Empire State Dairy Company was founded in 1869. The earliest buildings on this site were constructed in 1906 to 07 when technological advancements were being made to improve the safety and quality of milk, when New York City required all dairy farms and milk processors to submit to inspection when the company was expanding its business. These 1906 to 07 buildings presently anchor the complex at the intersection of Atlantic and Schneck Avenues. And they were designed by Theobald Engelhardt in the Renaissance and Romanesque revival styles. Engelhardt, a prominent Brooklyn architect, is known for his commercial and manufacturing buildings, including buildings within the Eberhard Faber Pencil Factory Historic District in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. The complex was expanded in 1914 to 15 when milk started to be processed in high volumes and the company needed larger, more modern facilities. On Atlantic Avenue, the annex included four additional buildings, shown on the left, with a facade arrangement that grouped them in a uh, near-symmetrical composition. The 1914-15 annex was designed by Otto Streck. Streck, who is educated in Vienna, employed here in an abstracted classicist style featuring secessionist details. The central building includes intricate polychrome ceramic tile mosaics depicting pastoral scenes possibly the largest decorative tile installations to be produced by the American Oncaustic Tile Company. The, the mosaics provide a whimsical element to the industrial building, as well as a hint to the company's agrarian connections. 
The commission held public hearings in July and September 2016, and five people testified in favor of designation. The commission also received written testimony in favor of designation from Council Member Espinal. Representatives of the owner testified citing structural issues and significant hazardous waste on the site. Prior to the vote for designation, the owner submitted a letter supporting designation of the complex but asked the commission to recognize the reuse and remediation challenges in the building, which in building five, which the LPC did in the designation report. And I should say throughout the designation process, LPC worked very carefully with the, with the owners to address their issues and concerns. The commission designated the Empire State Dairy Company buildings as calendared and heard, and any future changes required by remediation efforts will be reviewed by the LPC. The next property is the Interborough Rapid Transit Company Powerhouse. This property is the final designation related to our backlog initiative and had been on the commission's calendar since the 1970s. It was heard most recently at the special backlog hearing of November 5th, 2015, when 22 people spoke in favor of designation, including council member Helen Rosenthal, and the owner, Consolidated Edison, spoke in opposition. However, since then, LPC has made a concerted effort to work with the owners to address their concerns about how landmark designation would affect a working power station. We've since gained Con Edison's support for the designation and earlier this year approved a detailed master plan to appropriately and efficiently guide future changes. Opened in 1904 to provide electric power to the pioneering IRT subway, the powerhouse re represents a unique integration of 20th century engineering and classical architectural expression. The largest electricity generating station constructed up to that time, its exterior was designated by, or was, excuse me, was designed by the renowned architect Stanford White in his typically opulent style. Since 1959, it has been owned by the Con Consolidated Edison Company. Located between West 58th and 59th Street and 11th and 12th Avenues, the building occupies nearly the entire block. The landmark site does not include the early 1950s annex shown in this photograph. The IRT subway was a remarkable achievement. Upon its opening in 1904, it was only the sixth subway in the entire world and at more than 20 miles in length, the largest subway ever completed as a single project. The new subway system was powered by electricity, which was then in its infancy as a form of motive power. Its powerhouse needed to be of unprecedented size with a waterfront location facilitating the delivery of immense amounts of coal and the removal of mountains of waste ash. Its builders sought a commanding site for the structure, reflecting their belief that, quote, the powerhouse of the city's great transit system will be something in which New Yorkers will take no little pride. The planning and basic design of the building were undertaken by a team of distinguished engineers, including John Van Vleck and Louis B. Stilwell. It would be an immense structure. As the powerhouse complete, near completion in 1904, it, it constituted the largest building operation underway in the entire city. Oops, I'm sorry. There we go. Within this building, coal was burned to a few boilers, um, which created steam that ran massive engines and generators. Electricity created by these generators was sent out across the city to power the entire IRT system. This section drawing shows the boiler house, which contained the building's massive coal hoppers and boilers to the left, and the operating or generating room, which contained the steam engines and generators to the right. With the basic design of the powerhouse worked out by its engineers, Stanford White was called in to design its exterior. White's design for the building's exterior masterfully concealed the disparate boiler house and generating station within elegant, unified facades. He cloaked the building in Milford granite, buff Roman brick, and creamy terracotta with classical ornament. Over the decades, White's design has been praised by numerous architects and historians. In 1940, the city purchased the IRT's equipment, including this building. In 1959, it was, required, it was acquired by Consolidated Edison Company. Under Con Ed's ownership, it provided power to the subway system for many years before it was converted to a generating plant for the city's steam system. Over time, as technologies to produce and deliver energy have changed, the building has been adapted to meet evolving power needs. Such adaptations have resulted in changes to the building's exterior, including the removal of the original smokestacks and construction of a new, higher smokestack at the building's eastern, and eastern end, and changes to windows and entries. 
Despite these alterations, the IRT Tower House retains its classical grandeur. As an architecturally significant structure designed for the production of power, it has retained its continued use of the power station. It plays a vital role in the city's utility infrastructure as part of Con Ed's Manhattan steam, sy steam system, the largest in the nation, which serves hundreds of Manhattan buildings, including the Empire State Building and the United Nations. We urge the council to uphold this truly monumental designation. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by my colleague, Councilmember Mark Traeger. That's right. Are there any questions uh, from the committee at this time on either item? Okay. We will move on if there are no questions. You may step down. We will call the next panel at this time. Andrea Goldwyn. I think this says Simpson. Simeon. Okay. You know who you are. <laughs> Sean. Zumilina. Both items, please. Mm -hmm. You may begin. Good day, Chair Adams and Council Members. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is pleased to support designation of the Empire State Dairy Company and the IRT Powerhouse regarding the Dairy Company. As the city undertakes neighborhood rezonings, increasing development pressure, we appreciate that the Landmarks Commission has prioritized buildings for designation that have significance to these communities. The Empire State Dairy is certainly such a site. This complex, which is eligible for listing on the state and national registers, is part of East New York's early 20th century industrial history. With a prominent location on Atlantic Avenue, it served as a distribution center for the Empire State Dairy and later the Borden Dairy. The low-scale masonry complex is notable for the 1904 corner building attributed to Theobald Engelhart, the prolific architect responsible for numerous industrial, residential, and religious buildings in North Brooklyn. It retains distinctive round and segmental arched windows on both facades. The larger 1913-14 building by Otto Strack features two large ceramic tile decorative panels illustrating pastoral scenes of cows and their herders in a setting of pastures, streams, and snow-capped mountains, an exquisite site on Atlantic Avenue. The Empire State Dairy is well-deserving of landmark designation for its association with local history and its attractive architecture. We hope that this designation will open up opportunities for adaptive use of the complex so it can pay a play a major role in East New York's future. Okay, and very quickly regarding the IRT Powerhouse, the Conservancy is pleased to support designation of the IRT Powerhouse. This Beaux-Arts masterpiece is significant for its design as the work of a prominent architecture firm and as an example of an era when civic structures were monuments of the urban landscape. We'll get right down to that third point. Uh, this is perhaps the most important quality. In New York, we're fortunate to have many handsome buildings designed by famous architects. In the IRT Powerhouse, we also have a, a reminder of the great pride that cities can take in their own achievements. Inspired by the City Beautiful movement, the Powerhouse is like other civic buildings, such as post offices, transportation hubs, and utility stations constructed as cities expanded in the early 20th century, housing practical uses in extraordinary structures. In this regard, the IRT Powerhouse, which was built to represent the triumph of a transit system that allowed thousands of people to move across New York every day, is a soaring tribute to the urban experience. We thank the Landmarks Commission and Con Ed for taking the necessary time to devise a plan that facilitates designation of this landmark. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you to identify yourself for the record since we didn't do that? Andrea Goldwyn, Landmarks Conservancy. 
Thank you, Andrea. I'd also like to recognize that we've been joined by my colleague, uh, Council Member Isaac Miller, as well. You may continue. Good afternoon, Council Members. Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. HDC is pleased to support both of these important buildings for landmark designation. Very briefly, uh, actually, I can see some of the Council Members looking at this little booklet, uh, the which is East New York, is one, one of the areas that we had worked with in uh, our Six to Celebrate program, and uh, it would make a lie of me if this were not designated, because in it we say that this is an individual landmark, because they had voted on it at the Landmarks Commission. But more importantly, um, and I know that my colleague Zumalina will talk about this, the, uh, the Empire Dairy is one of the standout buildings in East New York, and we are thrilled that the Landmarks Commission took the step to designate it, and we hope that the Council supports that designation. However, it is not the only building worthy of preservation in East New York. There are uh, more than a dozen remarkable pieces of that community that's that are under threat by lack of protection, and um, we hope that the Commission and this Council will look into that. With regards to the, uh, oh, and interestingly also, the the terracotta panels that are so remarkable on the outside of that building were made by the American Encaustic Tile Company building, which, I which was itself also looked at as a potential landmark until it was defaced prior to the East Midtown rezoning. So we have a situation where rezonings, which are incredibly important to the city to enable us to continue to grow, can come at the risk of historic architecture. We feel that those two goals should work together. Um, with regard to the IRT powerhouse, echoing my colleagues' uh, comments about the importance of civic architecture, this is truly a landmark building. It is representative of the subway that helped build New York and develop it into the city that we all love today. It is a handsome building, but its historic importance outweighs even its monumental architecture. We are also thrilled that uh, Con Ed has come to an understanding with the Landmarks Commission because we believe that historic landmarks continue to be used and can be used for a variety of things. It is a, it's a misnomer that many people feel that landmarking freezes buildings in time or automatically turns them into museums. No, landmarks continue to be homes, residences, uh, company buildings, commercial uses, and in this case, even still a working powerhouse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, Chair Adams. This is Sean Corsandi from Landmark West. I'm speaking again on behalf of the powerhouse, the IRT powerhouse, to echo my colleagues here. Uh, I want to thank Lisa for everything she said about it. She covered so much of what I was going to say. Uh, but just to point out that this 114-year-old building was such a key part of a time when we took such great pride in our infrastructure, which in many ways is probably at its nadir. And I want to quote from a 1904 article in the New York Times, which was just talking with excitement about this building, which although it itself was late and delayed the opening of the subway in the first place, uh, still came uh, to transport us. The interborough, rap the interborough management is entitled to a compliment for the civic spirit shown in adopting a design for the powerhouse, which makes it an ornament to the neighborhood in which it is placed. By reason of the attention given to the chaste and admirable scheme of decoration and the building of its stacks of the same kind of bricks employed in the facades and necessarily large costs of the plant was increased some $55,000. It cannot be doubted, however, that this liberality was repaid. The building is an ornament to the west side and enhances rather than diminishes the value of the surrounding property. But for its stacks, it might suggest an art museum or a public library rather than a powerhouse. That's from October 30th of 1904. So it's just such a great feature to have. Also, to once again, celebrate a full block long McKim Mead White civic building uh, of which we've lost uh, some key ones which led to the Landmarks Commission we know today. So I want to also thank the commission for its foresight. This, what we understand, would be the first working powerhouse anywhere in the world uh, designated. So once again, the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission is at the forefront, pushing the envelope of designation. So we appreciate their time and effort. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Zumalina Den, founder of Preserving East New York, also known as Penny. Penny is an organization advocating historic preservation for the neighborhood of East New York. I am here today on behalf of Penny to commend the city agencies in acknowledging this building as an important historic resource 
that represents the history of the city as a whole and specifically the history of East New York. However, <laughs> we are not satisfied. We have to do better than this. What does it say about the city when they have an agency in place, such as the Landmarks Preservation Commission, to help recognize buildings worth preserving, but the plan does not allow them to move an extra step forward into actually protecting those significant neighborhood features? Ever since the beginning, we knew the impact of what the East New York rezoning would cause within the other 14 communities that would follow in its footsteps. For this reason, we took it upon ourselves to beg the city to include historic preservation as an effective means of community revitalization to ensure that our neighborhoods are protected. If not, the rezoning plan would act, would act as a spinning tornado destroying every community so as it lands by allowing irresponsible and insensitive development within existing and established communities. We were heard, but the plan was approved like if our concerns did not have any validation. We ask for all of our endangered buildings to be protected, but only one was considered out of the 14. What an injustice that is, don't you think? What a crime it is to recognize the need for protection and not take the responsibility to do it. It's like when a parent abandons their child and leaves them vulnerable out there in the world, exposed to all the threats, knowing very well what the consequences could be. Would you do that to your own child, niece, nephew, grandchildren? <sighs> Would you? Our communities are no different. Like children, they need nourishment, guidance to help them grow into fruitful beings. How will our community survive if we don't take the responsibility to care for them? All of you are here because of us. We put you in this position. We voted for you to represent us the best possible way. So why are you not thinking about us when you make your decisions? We would like to believe that all of you got passionately involved in this career to make a difference. However, what happened when once in, you might have probably realized that the system is not set up for you to become community superheroes, but instead to follow an established agenda where many of you have felt trapped in between two walls and had to probably succumb to the unbreakable system. Has your old self survived? Have you let the system of politics break you and steer you away from what you truly believe in? Have you stayed true to yourself? Next time when something is presented in front of you to take a stance, forget about the big guy and think, are you, you? And are you doing this for the community that you represent? With this single designation, knowing that there are 13 other buildings at risk, and worse to know that the city recognizes this, we feel that we We've been left alone in the middle of the desert with starving hyenas. However, that has given us the strength to continue our work to help our people understand the power of preservation and show how together we can become stronger. Preservation is not just about saving history and pretty old buildings. It's about lifting communities up and empowering them. But clearly, this seems of no interest to the city Instead, the city shows how blinded it is by greed and money and focuses well on how to break our communities apart because that's the way it will take hold of the precious land and all the gold that it can extract from it by creating and implementing laws that instead of uplifting us, they're uprooting us into displacement. Why is it that this city is so afraid of losing money and not of losing communities? Let's get our priorities straight, and let us not destroy the neighborhoods that we love, for this is what makes New York City a special place. Thank you. Thank you very much for your passionate testimony. We appreciate you being here today, and we just want to assure you that um, we're doing everything that we can um, to preserve all of what is good and beautiful about New York City. 
Um, that is what uh, the New York City Council is dedicated to. That is what our Landmarks uh, Preservation Commission is, is dedicated to. All of your good work at Penny, we commend you for that. And we thank you for that. And we hope that you will continue to do exactly what you do. Hold us accountable because we are here for you. Uh, we believe in the goodness of this city and the goodness of its people. And I can assure you that myself and my colleagues sitting here on this panel are not about the greed. We're not about the money. I'm your next door neighbor. So uh, with that said, I will invite um, my colleagues if you have any questions or comments for this panel. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ben, thank you very much for your comment. I, I just want to uh, associate myself with the Chair's comments and echo them, um, but uh, speaking for myself and uh, the folks I see at this table, um, I promise you there's nobody in this council uh, who has sold out, who's forgotten where we came from. Uh, we're regular people from the city of New York. Uh, I'm from the streets of Brooklyn. That's where I grew up. I love my neighborhood. Um, and uh, as you can see, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I represent Borough Park and Midwood. But my community came from East New York. That's how we moved further south in Brooklyn. And uh, just going through this pamphlet, I noticed the synagogue. There are many, many more uh, like that in East New York that have become churches over time where people still go and pray uh, in a different religion and respecting the heritage of our city. So this body, uh, this committee, this subcommittee, and uh, the, my colleagues who are members of the subcommittee, I promise you they're doing everything they can to preserve and protect uh, our beautiful, beautiful buildings and our infrastructure in this city. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm obviously new to the committee and uh, not familiar with work. I just uh, I, I've not seen in my tenure uh, what is it? Uh, ooh, Fifteen landmarks from one community. Is that what it is? How many in uh, from East New York? How many? How many landmarks? Yeah, um, that we're addressing here today. Well, we're ju we're just addressing one. No, I'm, yeah. But um, that booklet. Um, All these have been landmarks. Yeah. No. Uh, that these that are considerations. This booklet is just showing you, showcasing you the buildings that are within the rezoning, um, that you know that that are landmark worthy, you know, and uh, not all of them were considered um, as based on landmark standards um, as landmark worthy. These are, the, these are some of the buildings that we believe um, are important to the history, but regarding the, um, the environmental impact statement of the East New York rezoning, um, Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, considered that from the 190 block rezoning area, mm -hmm. 14 buildings were considered landmark worthy, but only one building, which is the one that we're the here for mm -hmm. today, is the only one that actually got designated. Okay. Well, so this, uh, this booklet, we worked with um, the Historic District Council um, to just uh, bring awareness of, the, of those treasures that we have in the neighborhood. So. We brought them here today to show you that, you know, East New York is not about what we only see in the media, you know? So, there yeah, I just wanted, <laughs> I, I was just a little concerned that, um, so all of these have already been considered? No. And didn't make the cut? I mean, not not all of them. Some some of them from the booklet. H has any, is anyone can speak? Um, <coughs> well, I can, I, I can give a little more detail about what's going on in the booklet, which is these are all notable buildings within East New York. All of them, except for the Empire Dairy, are not protected. They're not landmarked. Um, as part of the environmental impact statement of the East New York rezoning, the Landmarks Commission, as part of its role in environmental review, looked at um, all the properties and said there are 14 which are el potentially eligible for landmark status, but they only actually moved on the one, which is the Empire Dairy, which is in front of you. So is it future consideration? One hopes. What, what I'm asking. One hopes. Okay. So uh, just for the record, born and raised in East New York, Maxwell was once my neighbor. Um, I, like all of these, uh, went to the PAL, never had the pleasure of being in the 75th precinct, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Interesting. Okay. And this is a, a, a magnificent uh, as the city. It was it was beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we've learned a lot today. We appreciate your testimony very much. We'll Thank take you. everything that you've said um, uh, under account, uh, and we take our job very, very seriously to protect you and the citizenry of New York City. So I thank you all very much. You may step down. If you'll give us just a moment to consider our next panel, we'd appreciate your patience. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, we are going to take our vote on our landmarks issues. I now call for a vote to approve LU20, the 827-829 and 831 Broadway buildings in Councilmember Rivera's district in Manhattan, which we heard on February 6th, LU26 in Councilmember Rosenthal's district, also in Manhattan, and LU27 in Councilmember Espinal's district in Brooklyn. Each of the local council members are in support of these items. Council, please call the roll. Chair Adams. Aye. Councilmember Barron. I vote aye. Uh, Councilmember Ku. Aye. Councilmember Miller. Aye. Councilmember Traeger. Aye. The items are approved uh, by a vote of five Five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, and they are recommended for approval and referral, uh, referred to the Folio and Use Committee. So we can continue to the public hearing on the issue of the. All right, thank you very much. The next item we will hear today is a pre considered LU. 
application number N180167 PXM submitted by the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter for a notice of intent to acquire office space at a building located at 255 Greenwich Street, Block 127, Lot 18 for the New York City Campaign Finance Board. The proposed office space is located in Manhattan Community Board 1, Council District 1, represented by Council Member Margaret Chin. Representatives of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services will present testimony on this item. We'll call up uh, Amy Loprest of the Campaign Finance Board. Yeah. Actually, the, there are no representatives from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. It'll just be um, myself, and this is my colleague, Eric Friedman, the Assistant Executive Director of Public Affairs. Do you have a slip, Mr. Friedman? He won't be testifying. He's just, okay. just supporting me. Um, good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the subcommittee. I'm Amy Loprest, Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. I'm here today to discuss the acquisition of new office space for the CFB staff consisting of the entire fourth floor of 255 Greenwich Street. I want to thank our colleagues at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for assessing our needs thoroughly and identifying an appropriate space that will better support our ongoing work. Our current facilities at 100 Church Street do not meet the current and future needs of the agency. As you know, the CFB administers one of the strongest, most effective campaign finance systems in the country and is directed by the city charter to perform voter education and engagement activities for all city elections. As new responsibilities and functions have been added to the CFB's mandates in recent years, our staff and the demand for public access have grown concurrently. For example, the mayor's state of the city focus on democracy pretends a further expansion of our work. Our staffing needs exceed the capacity of our current office. The day we moved into our office space at 100 Church Street, we were already at capacity. To meet our expanded responsibilities, the CFB currently has 116 full-time employees plus several part-time employees and interns. We have taken several steps to create more off space for staff by converting conference rooms, file rooms, and copy rooms into additional workstations, but additional space is still needed. Upon initial occupation of 100 Church Street space, the public meeting space was clearly insufficient to meet the demand for public access to our offices. To accommodate public attendance at our board meetings, two additional conference rooms, two smaller file rooms, and staff closets were eliminated to expand the size of our boardroom. In addition to board meetings, the boardroom is used to host the bi-monthly meetings of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, full, sta full staff meetings, and large trainings for our partners in voter engagement work. As you know, candidates who participate in the matching funds program are required to send personnel to CFB trainings. During 2017, we hosted 55 trainings for 647 individuals. Though the CFB provides these trainings year round, the original training room at our 100 Church Street office was able to accommodate only six to eight people at a time. This led to the conversion of another mid-sized conference room to expand our training room, which currently accommodates 12 to 16 people. Additionally, the unavoidable cost of running supplemental heating and cooling after hours and weekends in our 100 Church Street office represents an additional undue strain on our resources. <coughs> Due to the nature of our work, staff is often required to work evenings and weekends, especially in an election year, to produce the voter guide and approve payments of public funds on tight, legally mandated deadlines. Audit deadlines set in the Campaign Finance Act can also lead to off-hour work even during non-election years. For the current fiscal year, we were forced to budget $450,000 for supplemental heating and cooling in order to provide these necessary services to the public and the candidates in our system during the election year. The space identified for us by DCAS, based on their assessment, will accommodate the current and future needs of the agency and will provide added resource efficiencies. As noted, the CFB mandates have grown over the years and continue to expand. In recent years, charter amendments have added significant voter outreach and engagement efforts to our work and expanded our oversight to include independent expenditures in city elections. The most recent example is Local Law 238 of 2017, which directs the CFB to create an online system for voter registration. To provide these critical resources for city voters while continuing to manage our regular workload, additional staff is required. 
The space at 255 Greenwich Street is approximately 50,000 50, square feet, which will provide appropriate working space for our staff and satisfy demands for public access. The new space will have a larger training room, which will allow us to train more individuals in larger groups. With term limits creating an unprecedented number of open seats in the 2021 elections, this added capacity will help us meet the significant increase in demand for trainings we anticipate during the next election cycle. The new space will contribute other efficiencies to our work. It will provide the ability for CFB staff to produce candidate video profiles for our, on, for our voter guide on site. In previous elections, the CFB has contracted with a production facility to film and produce this useful resource at significant cost which also constrains our ability to provide scheduling flexibility for candidates during some of the busiest weeks in the election season. The building can provide supplemental heating and cooling to our space as required, alleviating the extra costs of the city imposed by our current location. The CFB has been working with DCAS since the fall of 2016 to locate appropriate space based on a comprehensive assessment of our needs. Their efforts have been considerable. 255 Greenwich is easily accessible by public transit, is within blocks of the New York City Board of Elections, the City Council offices, and City Hall. This acquisition resolves the challenges created by our move to Hundred Church Street, and we anticipate that the space will allow us to meet our obligations to serve the public and our local democracy for many years into the future. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Lopez, and welcome. Are there questions from the panel? Councilmember Barrett? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for coming. What is the present capacity at the facility where you are now, 100 Church Street? Um, I believe the f as we've built it out, I think the capacity is 100 people. And square footage presently? I'm going to get the number not precisely right, but it's about 17,000 square feet. Okay, so you'll be moving, the space you want to move to is 50,000 square feet. Yes, uh, based on the DCAS's assessment. Okay. I was shocked when I went into campaign finance at 100 Church Street and looked around and I said, this is it? So when you acquired that space, did you think that 17,000 or whatever it is was adequate for the work that you were doing? Why did you go to 100 Church Street with a limitation of 17,000 square feet? How did that happen? Um, again, I mean, we are guided by the DCAS in assessing the siting needs and um, we were previously at 40 Rector Street and right. and that building was going was they were removing all the public right. agencies from that and DCAS told us that this was all the space we were allowed even though we were clear that it was going to be too small right from the beginning. So you DCAS knew from the beginning that it was inadequate and now there's like a half a million dollars that the city had to take on for supplemental heating and cooling. I think that's irresponsible, and I'm not, you're just the person representing campaign finance. But I think that's very irresponsible of DCAS to put the city in that situation to take on uh, undue bur unnecessary burden for additional costs, and we'll have to certainly bring that up with them. And the other question that I have is that in your testimony, you talk about CFB staff will produce candidate video profiles. So. Who currently produces the profiles? I know there's an off-site location. Is that CFB staff that presently produces the profiles? No, we hire a whole production facility. Um, so you would then have to hire additional CFB staff if they're going to be the ones who will produce the profiles. Is that right? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with the video, it's not a... Um, Filming is not a super complicated uh, production, um, but the we would we haven't really completely assessed since we haven't had approval for the space yet. Um, assessed exactly how the operation would work. But one thing is absolutely sure is that the cost of hiring a production facility really limits the number of days that we are able to provide uh, for, to candidates to choose from to film their uh, their profiles. If we had the, the ability to film in house, uh, we could people could come at much broad, uh, longer period of time at more varied hours. Um, also, we can use those facilities to uh, expand our uh, videos that we produce for trainings uh, for candidates and other videos. So then, our would work. you anticipate that you would have to hire? staff that would be CFB staff that would have that responsibility for video? 
we, I mean, we'd have to look into whether it was more cost effective to hire people okay. or to, to uh, train uh, current staff. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barry. I am acknowledging uh, Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good. Good afternoon. So I just have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> I uh, so recently um, I did the uh, the video production for the 2017 election, and I think mm -hmm. it was in Greenwich, where they had the where you 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 rented out yes. a location to do the videos. Mm -hmm. um, what was the cost to 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 rent that out? Um, the cost about of that, uh, and again, it's not just for renting the space, but for a production. production. So it was about four hundred thousand dollars. To four hundred thousand dollars to rent out the space, pay for the, I guess the uh, individuals who are t doing the video, and and you were there for how many days? It was over the course. It was different days over the course of two weeks. So it was about uh, I, uh, six days of filming. Um, also, many of the staff that you saw when you were there, I mean, some of them were people who worked for that production facility, and some of them were our staff. Yeah. Uh, listen, it was a very professional uh, production video. When I went, I was very impressed with the way I was treated and, and the entire video. What I did not like was that I only had two shots, and I, and I made I made a mistake, and, and that was it, you know? <laughs> and so if... if um, uh, if everything goes well and you do move into this new location, you're going to identify space for a production video? Yes. And you're going to purchase equipment as well? Yes. I mean, so this is, again, we, you know, we're going to try and figure out the most cost-effective way of doing it. It may be renting equipment because equipment changes over the time. It may be, uh, you know, hiring seasonal people or, you know, uh, to just work the cameras. Uh, again, we haven't, because don't want to count our eggs before they're hatched. Um, the, uh, that's wrong. You had chickens before they're hatched. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, we, you know, we will plan exactly what the most cost-effective way of doing it is because, again, video equipment changes over the course of time, so you don't want to buy things that are immediately outdated, so it might be cheaper to rent um, uh, equipment. Uh, also, one thing that would allow is because one of the reasons we only have two shots is because if we only had a fixed amount of time, we had a certain number of candidates we wanted to apply, allow slots for. Um, if we have more time to do this, we'll be able to allow people more opportunities. We'll get more opportunities if we make a mistake. <laughs> Again, yes. it'll be part of the, the, the analysis of how to do the, uh, uh, for the, how to do that. We actually already did for a special election, I I'm not, I can't remember which last spring, I can't remember which district, off the top of my head. Um, we did, it in our current offices, we did a, a video voter guide. I think it was about, I, I think no more than six candidates, and we were able to give more opportunity, and we rented equipment to use for that. I, I came in in a special election in 20, February 2016, so I've gone through five elections, and I've done three video mm -hmm. um, shots, and they were done at Lehman College. Th this last one was the one that we did it down here. Um, so my question is, you know, you're going you're you're going from seventeen thousand square feet to fifty thousand square feet. Um, this uh, production facility, this space, you know, you're only going to utilize it once every four years. Um, so, if you decide not to purchase the equipment, and then you're just going to have the space there, what are you going to utilize that space for? Three and a half during the three and a half years until it's election time and it's video time. Well, again, two different, several different things. One. Um, there are special elections. We would be able to do, uh, you know, so again, I, I don't know if we're going to rent the equipment or buy some equipment and then rent some, um, but we could do video guides for the special elections, which sometimes we've been able to do with uh, local access uh, TV stations, as I said, once we did it in-house, um, but we would be able to do those more regularly uh, and plan for them. We also would be able to produce videos, which we'll be able to put on the web, on different way on trainings for the candidates on uh, more complicated issues on uh, trainings for our staff so we can use the video facility for many different uh, applications other than just the video voter guide for the four-year city elections yeah and that, that's one of the concerns that I had when I 
when I heard of this, I said, wow, they're, they're only doing videos once every four years. They are, there are exceptions where there are special elections. Um, but I was concerned about the amount of space that, was, that may just sit there for three and a half years unutilized. Mm -hmm. so, so it's refreshing to hear that the space may be used for training purposes as well. Yeah. It, it's not going to be empty space that mm -hmm. would just be sitting there. Um, you also mentioned here in your, um, your presentation that you were forced to spend $450,000 for supplemental heating and cooling. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Okay, so I, um, I'm not, that was what we put in the budget. I don't have the actual um, final figure that was actually expended, but it's based on the fact that the current building, uh, we don't have, we don't control our own supplemental heating and cooling. Uh, it's controlled by the building, and they have to bring in someone to do it. So the average cost of doing that at 100 Church Street is $1,449 per hour, and you have to have a minimum of 10 hours. So at each time you need additional heating and, or cooling, you have to spend almost $15,000. Uh, so uh, so it's $14,490 each time. So, so what you're saying is that the normally business hours are 9 to 5. I understand that your business hours are different because of the type of work that you're doing and the orders that you're trying to kick out in, in this timeline. I totally understand it. But overnight, you're, you're saying so the heat and the air conditioner is just turned off. Yeah. So you can walk in in the morning to your office and it's uh, it could be a very warm office. If it's a summer day. If, yeah, if I'm, I, again, I'm not, I, I know that because I've been there. I mean, at 6 o'clock, the air conditioning, the heating go off. Um, they turn it on in the morning. I don't know exactly what time. Uh, but if you are sitting in the office during the summer by, on a hot day, by 6.30, if, we didn't, if you didn't pay for the supplemental air conditioning, it gets very, very hot. And this is a contract or a lease agreement that DCAS negotiated? Um, for you to move in from Rector Street? Again, they yeah, DCAS negotiated this lease. We were not aware of this issue with the heating and air conditioning fully be until we moved in, so it was too late to, to tell them that. I mean, they knew what that, I mean, they certainly, we told them our needs. We told them that we worked, uh, you know, off at night and, you know, late nights during the summer to do the voter guide, to produce the, pay the work to do the payments. Um, again, uh, we were not, DCAS negotiated a, this lease for a bunch of city agencies that moved from 40 Rector to 100 Church Street at the same time. All right, and, and you you may not know this, but do you know if other agencies that moved into this building have the same lease where they have to pay for supplemental heating and cooling? I don't know. You don't know? All right, it's a good question. I'm, I'm interested in knowing. Um, what is, how much are you paying per square footage now at 100 Church Street? That precise number, I'm going to have to get back to you. And so, do you know how much you're going to be paying per square footage at Greenwich Street? No, because DCAS is working on the lease. They're working but, yeah. on the lease. And but you I can get those figures for you. Okay. okay. No. And and so. And so you're going to make sure that if everything goes well in this lease negotiation, supplemental heating and cooling is part of the lease, and there's not going to be an additional expense. Yeah, that was absolutely one of our main. Uh, requirements when we uh, filled out the application that DCAS has was that we have access that we control our own supplemental heating and cooling. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I just want to say for the record, you know, when we found out that this application was going through, we just were curious, um, your city agency going from 17,000 square feet to, to 50,000 square feet, you know, I mean, it's uh, um, a little, what, 33,000 square feet extra. Um, and, and, I, and I can understand in terms of your training space because I've been there. Um, uh, but it's a little frustrating, and I know that the mayor's office is here. We invited DCAS to this hearing, you know, and um, and it's not the CFB's fault. You know, if DCAS is negotiating this contract, they should have been here to answer these questions in terms of the, the dollar amount that we need for square footage. And it's insulting to this council that you're asking us to approve this application without having proper representation from DCAS. So I'm asking the administration to please hold DCAS, whoever made that decision, accountable and ensure that they come back so they can answer these questions. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. I'd like to echo those comments of my colleague. Uh, we're very disappointed um, in the lack of representation from DCAS at this hearing today. We feel that uh, we were at l we should have at least been respected enough in your behalf uh, to hear from them in order to champion your cause. Uh, uh, we are looking out for the best interests of all involved with this matter. Um, that said, uh, I'd like to invent, uh, invite Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Comments. You're very thank welcome. Thank you. Uh, Madam Director, thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm sorry you were not accompanied by DCAS, which as I understand the process uh, that DCAS undergoes is they essentially act as your real estate broker. Uh, you describe for them a set of needs, and you fill out uh, your program report, which mm -hmm. I've reviewed, and they go out and they hunt for, just like they do for an apartment, just like they do this, you know, just like any other real estate broker does this anywhere in the city. So ha once you've described for them your needs, do they audit that need in any way? Do they review it and say, well, maybe you don't need an extra conference room, maybe you don't need this, maybe you don't need that, maybe you can do better, maybe you can talk to Oath and see if they have extra space. Maybe we can figure out how to deal with the heating issue. Have, have they helped you in any way? Um, well, I think that, I mean, one, if you, you know, you looked at that needs, and it has a very precise, you know, uh, you know, each person gets this many square feet. And so, um, so we did talk about, uh, you know, what, what we needed and, and what the, their needs assessment allows for, you know, so I think it's the way it works is there's a certain number of conference rooms per number of people. The square footage is based on the level of the staff member. Uh, so we did talk about that. And so um, as terms of negotiating, we have talked a number of times about this heating and cooling issue um, because we knew it was going to be quite expensive over this year. Um, and, but I think that, again, it really worked the way you just described it. We filled out our needs in an assessment. They t asked us questions about our needs, and that was came in to be that final document, and then they went and looked for space for us. Okay, so, at, and at, obviously, you do share the, f the floor with Oath. Have yes. you ever had conversations with Oath, either uh, directly, bilaterally, or via DCAS, uh, up and back down, in order to figure out if there's any space need that can be shared with Oath, that somehow you can, obviously they, they have an enormity of courtrooms. Uh, those, there's no, there are no trials that happen after 4, 4.30. You have trainings that go from 5 to 7. Have you ever explored with Oath whether or not you can use their courtrooms for training? Um, well, as you uh, know, I mean, we've talked to them about space, and I, th I my understanding from them, there are conversations that they need space too, that they're, they're bursting at the seams also. Uh, we, in, when we were at 40 Rector, I don't know if you recall, we al always used a very, very large hearing room that Oath had, and I think it was for the, I'm going to get the name wrong, the Bureau of Standards and Appeals. Uh, uh, that, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> that, that was built for that, and when they moved from 40 Rector, they didn't build a space, the, sa a comp the same amount of size, because they weren't going to have those hearings at the Oath facility anymore. Um, so, again, also the training room is set up, our training room is set up with computers for so the candidates can learn how to use CSMART, so it would be a bit uh, cumbersome to, to do that. Also, we need access to our local area network, so we'd have to share. So it would be, a, I mean, we could investigate that, but it would be very, very okay. cumbersome. Um, as, as am I, uh, yeah. you are what we call a recovering attorney, <laughs> uh, no longer practicing, but in order to maintain yeah. our licenses, we're required uh, by the chief judge to undergo approximately 24 hours every two years of uh, classroom training, but we don't have to go to a classroom to do so. We can do it online. Uh, the lease that is being proposed by DCAS is a 20-year, four-month lease, and I anticipate, uh, you know, I, I, we now throw out phones every six months, pretty much. I anticipate over time technology will allow that uh, you would not necessarily have to have 600 and change people uh, tromping through the CFB in order to undergo training. Have you explored doing online training so that the actual physical space is not necessary? Um, well, one of the things we actually, you know, we do a post-election survey after every election, and one of the questions we ask people is about this. And people uh, overwhelmingly who have attended the trainings prefer to do them on site because you can ask immediate questions, you, it's more tangible. Um, but again, you're right, I mean, over who knows in 20 years, you know, I might be able to think my training and uh, you'll know it. Um. I hope. <laughs> we, that's, that's, uh, Friedman encourages me often that uh, he can think it and I will know it. Um, 
just a few more questions and uh, hopefully we can get you on your way. And again, uh, it's, you know, uh, we're not able to apologize for DCAS uh, sort of abandoning you here at the, at the witness table, but they did. Um, and I, I anticipated that they would be here. I believe that uh, the chairs were informed that the city would be fully participating in these hearings. And, you know, the council uh, operates on the, on the strict clock. There are 20 days by which the council has an obligation to act or not act. And, you know, we don't control the clock. We don't control the calendar. Um, your hearing at CPC came up, you know, 12, 13 days after you filed your application. It was on the 31st. It moved right into the council. And I think the council uh, informed the administration uh, very shortly thereafter that uh, it was having a pre-scheduled hearing anyway and because of the clock needed to get the agencies in this time. So, uh, you know, I apologize that they've kind of left you here. Uh, explaining their work, but I have a few questions and I'm hopeful that you can answer. And, uh, you know, it's not, not in any way to sound uh, um, accusatory, of course. Uh, you know, you know me and you know it's, <laughs> you, no, you know, you know I have some familiar yeah. familiarity with the, ob okay. with the obligations of CFB and, and uh, as Mr. Freeman and I have spoken many times over the years, I love the CFB. <laughs> I love the work that it does. I think it's incredibly important. And my colleagues have all uh, indicated, uh, those who have spoken and those who have not spoken, that they appreciate the important work that you do. Um, as I counted it uh, through the program, you are proposing to have approximately um, 11 conference rooms, uh, plus two additional large gathering rooms for a total of 13, plus a reception area necessary to hold 25 visitors at a time. Uh, I've been to the CFB. Your current reception area can hold about eight. I've never seen more than three or four, but you know, could be 25 people show up at a time. Um, this council doesn't, I believe, have 11 meeting rooms uh, available for the 51 members or the 50 members who work in this building uh, to have uh, at any given moment. The conference rooms that you're proposing constitute 3,536 square feet, uh, carpetable square feet of conference room space, an additional 3,067 uh, carpetable square feet for multi-purpose rooms, the additional 840 uh, square feet carpetable for waiting area, and not to, I'm not uh, hyping on the carpetable, it's just it's a mathematical <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. thing that, the, you yeah. know, we multiply it by 1.4 in order to get to yeah. the right number because that's just the way the, the it works um, and you have to use the math in order to get to the right place. And then I'm fascinated, uh, there is a request for 280 uh, carpetable square feet for parking space. I'm assuming you're not putting a car on the fourth floor, but it is in the no, program yeah, report. Um, <laughs> and that totals about 7,700 square feet of space. And um, uh, that's in addition to, or uh, that in, in addition to that is the recording studio of 1,490, uh, 1,500 square feet. I don't ha have my office here in this building. My colleagues don't have more than six, 700 square feet in which we keep six or seven or eight people at a time. We squeeze everything we own into that. Um, and yeah, so I, and I do this little preamble to say, you know, we're at a time, obviously, you know, we have the fat years in the city, we have the lean years in the city, and we're approaching those lean years, and we have to be careful. And I'm just asking, is there any way that we could have done a little more with a little less at 100 Church, particularly given the expense that the city put into building that place out per spec? And it was per spec, even though you were forced in there by DCAS and to, not to your blame at all. Um, you know, you're, you're simply the tenant and DCAS is effectively your landlord. And they tell you this is where you live and you're yeah. kind of stuck with that. But they also build it out to spec per your spec. So my question is, could a little more be done with a little less so that 50,000 square feet and hundreds of thousands of dollars of infrastructure cost in order to build out the space uh, is not necessary? Well, I'll tell and that was a long question, okay. and I apologize, <laughs> but I know you followed it, yeah. it mm -hmm. entirely. Okay. Well, I, I have a couple things to say. Um, so when we moved in, uh, you know, we, since we've moved to from from Forty Rector to Hundred Church, we've built thirty one new spaces for staff. So I mean, it is it, a lot of the space. While there's a lot of common space, and again, that is based on a formulation that uh, was in that in the DCAS speculation. So we put in the number of people, the number, and they calculated those number of conference rooms. So um, I'm happy to get back to you about how that's calculated, but I, it's not, I guess my answer to the, about that is I'm not sure. Um, Ms. The, Director, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm, I apologize yeah. very much, but the, the, the need is outlined by the, by the agency, not by DCAS. In other words, D, the, DCAS 
ECAS is told by the agency, this is how many people we have, and this particular department, just picking one, I'm picking, I, I turn to yours, I'm, so I'm okay. turn off because I don't want you to think that that's why I did. Um, I turn to candidate services, and candidate services is, is completed with the director's office, 168, manager's office, 140, workstations uh, times 10, 770, and then, but the, the agency, not DCAS, tells DCAS, how, well, we, this, this particular unit of our functions also needs three mini conference rooms and also one multifunction. Yep. They don't, the DCAS doesn't determine Some that. of that is based on, a, they have this big, how do you calculate the spaces that you might need? So, because again, we're not architects. Um, so they have a different a way to calculate, you know, based on the number of people, how many, so you're right, we did put that into that form, but it's based on a calculation that's provided, um, you know, specifications from uh, DCAS. And we, um, so for example, that those three mini conference rooms are to allow for the candidate services unit to have conferences with candidates in private and you know rather than having to sit in the public area to discuss you know to help them do their filings or to answer questions for them uh, so that yes we worked it into our specialized needs but but with without focusing on the square footage which assuming that DCAS does that mathematical mm -hmm. dancing yeah. and comes up with the number but it's the the number of rooms the need itself for the rooms is as outlined and identified by the agency campaign finance has told DCAS hey we need 11 conference rooms plus we need these additional two multi functions rooms I mean, and I just want to point out that in the 11 conference rooms you have you have a need for one small conference room with AV for 336 feet for your public affairs unit uh, needing to accommodate eight people and also one small conference room with the need for AV uh, constituting 336 square feet for your public relations department. So your public affairs department gets 300 square feet conference room for eight people, and your public relations department get 336 square feet uh, for conference room. And I'm just saying, you know, if I want to do a conference and Chair Adams has got a room, I got to have a different time for my conference. And you're one agency of 150 right now people, and you've grown uh, from approximately 90 or so a year ago to 130 or thereabouts this year. In 2016, when you filled out the report, it was approximately 125 people. Uh, I'm sorry, you filled out the report indicating that you uh, wished to plan for 150 people, but in that uh, plan of 150, you indicated that at that time uh, you had 33 vacancies, uh, 117 at that point. So I'm just saying, can you know? you guys figure out how to share conference rooms a little better so that you don't need to build out 11 or 13 because all DCAS is doing is is spitting numbers back out based on what you tell them your need is. If you tell them you have 16 managers who need office space, well, they figure out how much the footage is. I get that. And if you tell them, well, we need 11 or six or two conference rooms, they figure out the square footage, I get that. But ultimately, the agency is t telling the landlord what it is we need and that's on the agency. Yeah, except again, I, based of it, it, many of these, I mean, right now we have, I think, three conference rooms. Um, you know, one only one of which fits more than four people. I guess two, because we've knocked down a wall. So two now fit, so we took down one and said um, that fit more than four people. Uh, the, again, it was, there's a, a formula from that again we use from DCAS that uh, was had you know okay you have this number of people this number of office space so this kind of person can get you know so you see there's all different like cubicle sizes and different sizes those were not based on you know just us saying oh these people need a four by four cubicle this kind of person needs a eight by eight cubicle those are based on a DCAS uh, resource allocation and that's where the number of conference rooms came from. But based on you telling them, telling DCAS how many, how many people, people we had. Yes, how many absolutely. human beings yes. you need to yes, plan for. Absolutely. And, and the eleven the eleven conference rooms plus the two multi use rooms are also based on the agency, not yes. maybe not you, but people in your agency identifying to DCAS that we have a need for thirteen conference rooms to carry forth hundred and fifty people. And I'm just saying that I can't imagine all thirteen are going to be used at the same time. Yes. And there's got to be a better yes. way um, and, you know, ultimately the goal here is to figure out a way that, you know, you're at a place that's already been built out. Is there a way that the city of New York can save the money of, A, doing a more expensive lease, 
building out that place, uh, letting it for 20 years and four months so as to lock us in as taxpayers to carrying that forth for the next 20 years. I mean, you know, we, just to, just to uh, uh, give you the analogy, you know, we run campaigns every four years, and if I were to take a campaign office today that were to be, you know, 6,000 square feet because in November of 2021, I anticipate that would be my need. I'm not suggesting you, you have, you're able to function the same way. You clearly can't. But what I'm saying is this is a 20-year lease, and the question is, is this the right, uh, you know, large um, amount or largesse of, of space to take on without having maybe considered if we can do a little better? Isn't there an opportunity to go back to the drawing board and and do this program need again and go back to DCAS and saying we could probably do a little a little less worth and maybe they could find something a little better. Maybe they can maybe they can move oath and you can take over the whole oath floor and then you'll have that whole floor because you said oath is also birth bursting at it seems and they have all that space out there already built out. So uh, I'm, uh, what I'm indicating here is that in, in my view and you know I'm um, not a mathematician and I'm not an architect at all but I'm looking at uh, a demand for space that where you're at 17 right now and you wish to go to 50, and I understand that the agency is not accountable for approximately 12 or so thousand uh, square footage, which the only reason you're going from, from what your request of 30, 32-ish is what you're saying you need to 50 is because there's just basically dead space. The landlord is saying you have to take this entire yes. fourth floor if you want the fourth floor. So right away, the agency is being told you have a need of 32,000 square feet. We're going to give you 50,000 square feet. You have to rent the whole 50,000 square feet. And if I were looking for a two-bedroom apartment and my broker told me, well, I can't give you a two, but I'm going to give you a six, and it's going to cost you eight times as much, you know, I would say, no, I can't. I can't afford that. That's not a good use of my money. I don't need four extra bedrooms. And my question is, can you go back to DCAS and say, let's go back to the drawing board again. This 255 Greenwich is not the right fit for us. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things. One is, I mean, obviously we are planning for increased mandates. I mean, every um, I've been executive director for about 10 years, and we've increased the number of mandates uh, and therefore the comp accompanying number of staff numerous times over that 10 years. Uh, the mayor has indicated in his state of the city that uh, – he will be focusing on democracy initiatives, educating voters, uh, increasing the number of people registered and the number of people getting out to vote. We anticipate that that will be add to the number of staff that we require. Right now, our voter staff is about four people. I mean, other people help with that work. But again, we, uh, we, we won't be able to meet those obligations without additional staff. Um, having also moved into a space that was too small, uh, I am you know, reluctant to say, and also there's time constraints. <clears throat> As you work with the, in the election cycle, so do we, and you know, um, going back, it's been, we've been working with DCAS since the fall of 2016. Um, it's, uh, so we, there's a time frame to move in the middle of the election year is quite um, cumbersome for our staff. Uh, and also uh, we, um, I assume we looked, I mean, Deke has looked for a lot of different spaces for us. I mean, and, you know, we would like to, one of our requirements that we said, you know, which is important, is to be able to be close to, so the candidates can go to see our staff, can go to the Board of Elections easily, to go um, to City Hall, to the City Council, if they needed to. And so um, being more centrally located is one of the important, uh, and so I know that, again, they did the siting work for us, and, um, and this is the space that they identified as the most useful. You're, as you point out, it is more than what we had originally asked for. Right. Um, I'd, I'd like to follow up on what Chair Salamanca asked earlier regarding the videotaping and something that I know had been previously suggested to CFV, um, and Mr. Friedman's aware of this, and I'm, I'm assuming you are as well, is the, the notion of that we take all the candidates from around the city and we force them to go down to the village to do taping. Here, we're not saying go to the village, we're saying go to the CFV, but I'm wondering if the CFV has uh, inquired uh, or investigated at all whether or not, for example, um, CUNY uh, schools that have uh, video recording equipment like uh, Lehman College up in the Bronx, uh, like Kingsborough and Marlboro, like I believe College of Staten Island, Staten Island, I'm assuming there's places in Queens uh, that the chair will tell us about, there are places that belong to the city of New York 
that can be used without incurring a single penny other than your own staff time and they're already on payroll and maybe some additional tech work um, and you wouldn't have to buy equipment and you wouldn't have to buy space for that and you wouldn't have to let you know this additional area and you wouldn't have all this debt area sitting and you know there but for the grace of God waiting for a special election or waiting for once every four years where you get to use it for 10 days. Um, so again would the difficulties related to that, I mean, in addition to logistics issues, but the um, ensuring that the quality of the voter, the profiles are exactly the same. Um, I, again, I'm no video expert, but um, I, I mean, I assume that, you know, different equipment uh, can produce different quality of videos, and you really would not want to say that the candidates from Brooklyn had a different quality of video um, than the candidates from the Bronx or Manhattan. And so making sure that they're uniform and consistent is, a, is an important uh, concern. And I'm not that that, I'm not saying that that couldn't possibly be overwhelmed. Again, I don't know anything. I'm not a video production expert. I'll defer to uh, the chair for additional questions and uh, or release my time. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, look, I, at the end, I, I you know, I, the, obviously the committee, the subcommittee is not going to vote on it today. I'm not a member of the subcommittee. Um, but, you know, I, I truly believe that that in the environment and the era of doing more with less, um, and it's not, again, not the board's fault at all because you, you came in with the request, you followed DCAS standards, you did what you told, they're your boss on this, and we're surely not your boss on this at all. Um, but I believe that, you know, even even at the high end, and, you know, I don't want to call this, uh, uh, the numbers exaggerated, but, you know, I, I think because of the way DCAS does its formulas, they are somewhat artificially inflated. And I think that uh, DCAS should be asked to go back to the drawing board. And you also brought up yourself uh, in the last few moments um, a very interesting question of whether or not the mayor is going to do some mandates that force you to have additional obligations that require additional staffing. Have you spoken with the administration to see if there's something on the drawing board that you may find out in six months that, you know, oh, oh my gosh, the CFB has to hire another 100 people? Because what do you do if the CFB has to hire 100 people and you just built out 50,000 square feet and you don't have the space for them? I, I don't anticipate, I mean, we, I mean, I think we probably will need more people, but I think doubling the staff size is probably not uh, going to happen. I mean, we've already allowed for some increase uh, Granted, of course, with the extra conference space that can be used for additional staff, I mean, that's what we've done at, at 40 Rec, at 100 Church. Is there harm to asking DCAS to go back to the drawing board and aim to hit that 32 or thereabouts number a little more scientifically? Um, the only harm is, again, is, is, the, is the timing. And um, because it takes a quite a bit of time um, to do this, and I assume that we would, I, I again, I'm not, 100% familiar with the land use process either, but um, it has been, you know, this has been a time consuming because you needed to get approval from the Department of Buildings and from city planning and from this committee, subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, so that I assume would add time and again. Month or two? I, I, Whatever, I, you know, not, just ask, just ask them. I assume that they have spent the, They've done their due diligence to make sure that they found a space. So I one would ask. Help. Yeah. Well, so I would assume that they had done that already. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam yeah. Director. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to uh, wrap up. I want to thank my colleagues um, for expanding on this hearing. Uh, the questions have been uh, very worthwhile. We are going to address all further DCAS questions and CFB questions in a letter uh, to DCAS and to CFB. Uh, so that we can get uh, any other questions answered. Um, uh, are there any other m members of the audience that are here to testify today? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I am now closing the public hearing on this issue, and we are going to uh, lay over all other items on this agenda. I want to thank all members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>